Welcome. Node connected. RNU-474 monitoring. Hope you're doing well. Does your right twice as you want, I'll be clear. Roger, Roger, will do. Uh, take care, we'll talk soon. WGN-216, uh, uh, standing by. Right, it looks like we're all linked up. This is WRJK797. The time is now 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time. And uh, stand by, we're going to begin this week's TechNet. Good evening, everyone. Again, this is Quentin. That's with a Q, as in Quebec. Call sign WRJK797. And uh, tonight, I am honored to be your net control for this Wednesday's TechNet. We meet every Wednesday evening at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, 7 Mountain, <laughs> and currently 6 Arizona, to help answer your technical questions. <clears throat> there is a hard limit of one hour for this net, and additionally, we are also live streaming this net on the MyGMRS YouTube channel, uh, WRUZ914. Are, are we live streaming tonight? We are streaming on YouTube tonight. Awesome. I'll make sure to stop by and uh, give a like and see if any questions pop up on there. We'll, we'll try to answer those as well, time permitting. And this is a directed net, meaning all traffic should be coordinated by net control. If there's any emergency or priority traffic at any point, feel free to break in at any time. We have these nets every week, 
So if you're in an emergency or if you need to contact a friend or a loved one, feel free to break. Uh, the system is primarily there to be used by you, the operators. Reset. All right, so there is no roll call or check-ins. Instead, the way this TechNet works, we will have an open call for questions, and we will then allow time for others to help answer them. Please remember to let the repeater carriers drop, repeater's carrier drop between transmissions. There are many repeaters tied together for this net, and some of them can take five, six, seven seconds. So when we leave, try to leave pauses so they can ID. Before we begin, does anyone have any general announcements for the net? Please give your call sign now. Wow, only three minutes in, and I've already uh, got a scratchy throat. That's what I get for trying to do silly voices. And uh, we do have a message in here for the uh, SWCRS members. So again, this only applies to uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. By the way, are there any Colorado stations out there? Are you guys having any issues hearing me? All right, uh, nothing heard from Colorado, but um, yeah, if any of you guys have any issues hearing me over this system, then I'll, I'll switch over to the SWCRS Zello channel. So uh, the message for SWCRS is as follows. With the new repeaters that have recently come online and the increased daytime traffic, keep the following guideline in mind. Please limit your QSOs before 7 p.m. to 15 minutes or less. If you plan on having a conversation longer than that, uh, they ask that you move your conversation over to the sidecar hub. You can find instructions for operating the sidecar hub at southwest.network or swcrs.org. And uh, yeah, congratulations to SWCRS for uh, growing and becoming such a large system. Uh, you guys really inspire us over here in Texas. All right, so we're going to open the floor to anyone who has a technical question about the GMRS service. Please give your call sign now. All right, nothing heard. This is WRJK797 Quentin with September 22nd TechNet. And uh, if you guys don't mind, my wife and I are shopping for a dash cam. And I was wondering if anyone out there had any recommendations. The one that I'm looking at right now is the Garmin Minicam 2. And what I like about it is there's no screen, it's really small. And uh, you can, you know, hardline it directly into your battery, and it's, you know, really small and out of the way, which is good for her tiny car. Uh, WREZ914 recommended Blackview to me as a brand, but I noticed those ones are quite large. So, uh, yeah, does anyone out there have any dash cam recommendations? A lot of us are mobile quite often, and it's good to be safe financially and otherwise. Looking for... Uh, Answers. Please give your call sign now. We are at five five zero six. That sounded like Operator Steve. Operator Steve, good to hear you. How the heck are you? Vim is a fiddle, but not quite wound as tight. Quentin, it's good to hear your voice too. When it comes to dash cams, one of the things that I've noticed is the ability to 
to actually use it. So I've got one by a company called Ape Man, A D E M A N, and it was relatively inexpensive, and it's really high definition, and it's got a white screen, and it's got a battery which doesn't last long at all. So I keep it plugged into the cigarette lighter charge. The trouble is, is when I want to review anything, it's a very, very complicated set of buttons. Push this one, come down to menu, push that one. It's not very intuitive. My concern about that is in the event that maybe I, heaven forbid, get into a car accident or I observe something in front of the vehicle and it gets recorded, I'm happy to say to many of the responders, oh, yeah, I got it right here. I got it recorded. Uh, I'll have to show it to them, which is uh, less than an easy thing to do. So what I end up doing usually when I want to review is I pull the memory card out and I stick it in my computer. Yeah, Steve, that, that sounds frustrating, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. So, uh, yeah, what's selling me so far on the, the Garmin, this new Minicam 2 that came out about two months ago, is that it, it has kind of like its own, you know, Wi-Fi connection, and you use an app on your phone to connect over a, you know, local Wi-Fi, you know, device to device, and... Uh, there's also a button on there you can press whenever there's an incident, you know, so it gets highlighted and never gets deleted. But you can review all the, the footage on, on, the, on the phone right away, and then you can save it to your phone. And it's also saved to a micro SD card, so you can do it that way as well. But it is pretty expensive. It's like $130. And uh, then there's like a polarizing filter for another $20. So, uh, and then there's a, the parking cable is extra, probably another $20, so that's 170 And then if we want to have, you know, a professional install it, that's probably at least another $30, you know, to have that cable run uh, professionally. So $200 for just a little camera. It seems expensive. But, uh, and also I've heard, you know, there's, there's probably so many things that can go wrong with the software. Uh, back to you, Operator Steve. Yeah, I think I paid about $125 or so for this one about a year ago, and that was considered inexpensive at the time. So it sounds like the prices are kind of coming down. Um, as far as running the, the cable goes, that's just your power cable, and it's, it's really not a difficult thing to do. There's a suction cup that holds the camera to the, the windshield, and then in my case, I have it up high behind my rearview mirror so that it does not obstruct my view. Uh, and I just run the power cable up into the headliner. Um, right there at the windshield, almost every car, you've got a space at the headliner there. And you just kind of tuck it there and down the A-pillar and uh, fish it uh, through the dash and then out, out a little space somewhere on the dash and plug it into the, uh, plug it into the cigarette lighter. Um, the neat thing about that is it doesn't have to be on all the time. I don't have to remember to, to turn it off. I can just pull it out of the cigarette lighter. Else, it's on 24 hours a day. WRJK797. Yeah, that sounds like uh, I might be able to run the cable myself then, if it is that easy. And uh, basically, it's my wife's car, so I want to be able to set it up in a way where she never has to touch it or think about it unless, you know, something happens, in which case we're going to want that footage. We have people all the time doing crazy stuff on the road, and you kind of have to get lucky and, you know, slam your brakes and hope that you don't crash into them because they've decided to do a U-turn, you know, at 65 miles, miles an hour at night on a wet road when it's raining. <laughs> and uh, if you hit them from behind, you know, after they've done that crazy maneuver, it would technically, without dash cam footage, you know, be considered uh, at fault. So we really don't want that. Oh, it's so good to hear you, Steve. Uh, every time we see a, a Volkswagen Beetle, I think of you, and uh, we play a game where we, we smash the bug, and I was winning too much, so now it's a, we play it cooperatively, and uh, yeah, I'll pass it back to you for any last closing thoughts, and then I think there was another station trying to pop in, so uh, back to you, Steve.
Well, thank you, Quentin. I appreciate that. Yeah, Slugbug. Who hasn't played Slugbug? Uh, so my final thought on that would be when you mount the camera, avoid having it um, get in your field of view anywhere. I found that having it up high and um, behind my rear view mirror, I don't even see it. And um, that, that raised elevation of the camera does give you a, a, a lot more... Uh, a lot more view, a lot more area to record. WRFI 506. Comment. And WRMG 216. All right, thank you so much, Steve. That was some, some really good tips and pointers for things you know to look out for when purchasing and then where to mount it. And uh, I really appreciate it, Steve. we got to talk more. I miss you guys over there at SWCRS. I should sp spend some more time on Zello with you. And uh, I heard a comment, and I also heard 216. So uh, over to the station, it was a comment. Uh, and also uh, give your call sign and your comment. Over to you. Uh, 216, please stand by. WRNU474, Mark, in the mountains. Mexico. One comment about the dash cam uh, and having it be uh, as easy as possible for your wife, depending on how new the vehicle is, um, if it's plugged into the cigarette lighter all the time, um, most cars have a electronic monitoring system these days that will not drain the battery, so after a certain period of time, it would automatically turn off anything plugged into that cigarette lighter. It all depends on the vehicle and how new it is. That's all I've got. This is Mark in the Mountains. Over to you, Net Control. Oh, cool. Yeah, thank you, Mark, Mark in the Mountains. We've got a lot of Marks in our system, too. So, uh, yeah, we have nicknames for every Mark. But, uh, yeah, those are some good points as well. I might not even need to do that parking cable. I know with ours, we have a... I plugged in a Baofeng UV5R into the cigarette lighter, and it would turn off with the car, and then it would beep saying that it was on every time the car came on. So, yeah, that, that cigarette lighter thing might just work perfectly. And uh, I thank you for your, your addition there, Mark. That's a good thing to think about. You can save money on you know professional installs and having it run directly to the battery. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And also, 216 is out there. We'll hand it off to you. Yes, good evening. WRMG 216. Uh, many hellos out of uh, the great uh, Minnesota. Um, as a uh, multiple uh, dash cam uh, person, um, I can uh, I can only recommend the Van True V A N T R U E uh, uh, N four three channel four K dash cam. Um, a lot of comments I heard about uh, with the power cables and stuff like that. Uh, as also a mechanic, uh, most new cars all the uh, cigarette lighters turn off when you turn the car off. Um, also, something else to be noticed is um, the parking feature on almost every camera will not work unless it has a permanent connection. So if you're looking for something to help you um, protect your car when it's parked, then um, you will need something that plugs directly into the battery. Now, there's an OBD connector cable for a lot of these cars. I know the uh, Garmin Dash Cam, the Mini 2, uh, has a similar thing where you can plug in the fuse box. Uh, uh, one thing that should be noted is on most of the dash cams that are only forward pointing, it only has a field of view of, let's say, 150 degrees or so. Um, very few dash cams have 360 degrees and they go um, usually inside the roof of your car or something like that. And uh, very few um, look back and then in this particular case with the one I have in my Dodge Ram, um, it has uh, actually three 
three cameras. And there's an external camera that mounts on the back window. And then there's a camera that looks behind towards you. And there's a camera that looks up front. And they're all four, well, the one is 4K. Uh, front and rear is 4K. And uh, the one in back that does 1080p. Infrared is important while you're driving at night. 24-hour parking mode. And uh, the features go on and on. And I've been through this for cameras that have not functioned and didn't work when they needed to. And when I spent the extra money, and it is kind of pricey, uh, it pays off. WRJK 797. Uh, I made sure to leave about a seven second break there, so hopefully uh, everyone repeaters had time to reset. And uh, I really thank you for all of those points you brought up 216. I'll have to go over those one at a time here. But uh, yeah, just a note for anyone uh, who has a comment uh, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, to say break and, and leave a break in your transmission. Uh, some repeaters, you know, will uh, take longer to time out than others. But I think a, a few of them timed out. Uh, was there someone that needed to break into the system? That uh, last comment from the Sandia 675 that's saying, who cares? Uh, is there some traffic that you would like to, uh, to put over the system? Well, uh, if we are bothering anyone out there, we, we do apologize for taking use of the system. And uh, I understand this is a shared resource, so uh, you know we have to be able to make time for each other and uh, respect each other's transmissions and you know the effort that they put into uh, trying to bring the community together. But uh, yeah, 216, that's another one I, I, I wonder about is uh, having multiple cameras, having infrared, or having 4K, uh, I'm curious how uh, important it is to uh, to have all those extra things, especially when you're worried about, you know, is it even going to remember to record in the first place? And uh, the one I was looking at is 1080p, and uh, we don't really care so much, I guess, about uh, all the extra bells and whistles. But uh, I was curious if you think it really is worth it to uh, look for 4K. Back to you, 216. sounds like ideally that it has, you know, every feature you could possibly think of. So 216 uh, really recommends for Vantrue, and I found their website. It's uh, Vantrue.net, and that's Victor Alpha November Tango Romeo Uniform Echo. And, uh, yeah, he mentions the importance of having a front camera, a rear camera, an internal camera, infrared, 4K, and, you know, all the bells and whistles. That sounds, well, he's a mechanic, so he probably installed it himself. It sounds quite intimidating for us. 
plus our, our vehicle is tiny, so I'm a little worried about us being able to fit all that. But uh, if I ever buy an expensive truck, I'm for sure going to go for something along those lines. This is WRJK797, and uh, we're looking for uh, comments on this topic or questions of, uh, of a technical nature, radio-related or otherwise. Please give your call sign. This is WRU214. Is this the open repeater? Yeah, I don't I don't know if the Sandia six seven five is an open repeater, but uh, I hope not, because I'll have to admit that uh that comment was very uh, unexpected and uh yeah, it might be worth seeing if we can unlink that repeater whenever we have these nets. Uh, is there a WRCU uh what is it, Darren, are you out there? Yeah, I don't hear Darren 527 out there, but I would assume that uh, the Sandia 675 is not an open repeater. That would be pretty unusual. But, uh, yeah, back to that, that previous station. I don't know if we're going to be able to get a, an answer for that since none of them are on here. But uh, you can always visit SWCRS and become a member if you ever need any of the tones or information. Back to you. All right, negative response, and we'll continue on. We are looking for uh, questions or comments for this week's Wednesday TechNet. Please give your call sign. Seven eighty-two. Steve, oh my goodness, it's a marathon of Steves. Different Steve, Houston Steve. 782, over to you. WRFI 782, yeah, about the dash cams. Um, you know, being a trucker, they definitely would come in handy for me. And I was uh, using one a few years ago, but my problem was the mount because I have to uh, get out of my truck daily, and I could have a different truck every day, so I was constantly having to uh, pull that, that one out. Operator coming in from the Sandia 675 repeater in New Mexico. Please be aware that there are many, many repeaters linked up to this, to your repeater at this time. And if you do have traffic for the nets or uh, traffic of a personal nature, please feel free to say break and we'll make way for your traffic. Otherwise, please be respectful of everyone else as we're respectful of you. And Steve, are you still out there? You you dropped out towards the beginning of your statement. You uh, mentioned changing vehicles and the mount being difficult to pull out. Over to you. Yeah, WR5782. Yeah, I was having a problem with the last one I was using to where it was just uh, uh, maintaining its ability to stick to the windshield because I was having to remove it on a daily basis. You know, because I was using a lot of different trucks, and I couldn't just leave it in the truck. So if anybody knows the one out there that has a really good mount that does
ahead, break. Lubbock Station, you said you had a, a question about radios. Uh, can I get your call sign again and uh, go ahead with the question? And uh, I guess stand by for a moment, Steve. WRAM619. All right. WRMN619, go ahead. W-R-A-F-619. This is Matt. All right, got it. Whiskey, Romeo, Alpha, Foxtrot, 619er. Matt from Lubbock. All right, go ahead with your, your technical question. We're listening. Yeah, the question I have is, how far from the ground do I need to be up every feet for an antenna? How far will it reach out? Oh, wow. Yeah, that is a cool question. And I know there's some people uh, on here that are repeater owners and uh, should know a lot about that. I know Mark, uh, WREZ914, has studied that issue as well. So, uh, yeah, Steve, uh, I guess we spent a, a half hour talking about uh, dash cams. But, uh, yeah, get with me on, on Zello if you want to continue that discussion. I am WRJK797. Again, that's Whiskey, Romeo, Juliet, Kilo, 7-9-er-7. Seven, seven. Add me on Zello, and uh, I'll add you to my group. It's not linked in to GMRS, and uh, <laughs> we're going to be researching dash cams, it sounds like. So uh, let me break here. Seven seconds. 914. All right. Yeah, it sounds like we're going to be starting with David. Uh, I mean, Mark, that was a Freudian slip. I want to say thank you to David so much uh, for helping out with the Sandia machine, and I'm really sorry if anyone out there is uh, trying to use that machine to get in, but uh, yeah, from now on, uh, at least for, for now, we'll only be able to listen and not transmit on that repeater. So uh, David, you are incredible. Uh, we'll send it over to Mark. He's already uh, got some answers for how, how far from the ground versus how far will it reach. And, yep, over to you, 914. Yeah, what, uh, this is WREZ, 914. I think what you're looking for is what they call a line of sight calculator. Um, now, when you're transmitting on UHF, you can actually curve slightly over the Earth, but it's not much. So, you know, if you just took that out of consideration and you said line of sight with, based on the curvature of the Earth, just put that into your search engine. Um, there's some online calculators that come up. Um, there is a formula, but it's using uh, the square root of 2RH equals 3.57 times square root of H. And then you got to do some more formulas. So there is a formula to it. Um, so Google or search on the Internet, line of sight calculator. There's actually a really cool website on... Uh, rfelements.com and you can uh, do it on a computer not on or do it on a tablet or a computer not on your cell phone you can actually pick two points uh, put in the elevation of both points and it'll actually draw a, uh, a calculated uh, based on the terrain so you can actually see if you've got mountains or other things over that I think that was like the third option down on the search on Google but it's by RF Elements. Um, so approximately, let me ask the, 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 the questionnaire. 
Um, approximately how many feet are we talking in the air? And I can give you a mileage uh, based on that uh, on this website. Well, I'll put an antenna about 30 feet in the air, and I couldn't reach five miles. Yeah, so we've got a few things going on there, I think. Uh, 30 feet in the air, uh, curvature of the Earth, not taking anything else into consideration, gets you 6.71 miles. So you should be hitting the 6.71 mile range based on line of sight. However, line of sight is, is exactly that, if you can see it. And um, 30 feet in the air, uh, if you're uh, in some trees, shrubbery, or anything else, uh, those can actually take away from some of that. Um, one thing that I know I'm very familiar with uh, here in the Houston area is we have some very moist uh, trees and, and, and shrubbery. Uh, that, that they tend to hold a lot of moisture, which uh, effectively absorbs the RF signal. Um, so our range at, at transmit level, either uh, mobile or handheld, is actually a lot more limited because of the RF being absorbed into the greenery around us. But if you are on a flat plain desert and you were looking straight at uh, the curvature of the Earth, that would be 6.71 miles at 30 feet in the air. Four seven four. Okay, I'm not sure what point went. 474, go ahead. Hi, it's Mark again in the mountains. Um, another factor I would think in, in the antenna location um, is the wattage of what the radio is putting out. Also, um, there's a number of factors of loss, uh, what type of cabling is being used. Uh, I know that a lot of homemade antennas will give you a recommendation for the height um, and also what type of coax to use for optimum um, transmission range. But I would think that it matters whether you've got a handheld hooked up to it or if you have a 50 watt um, as to how far it would go on also considered. Uh, WRNU 474. Don't worry, Mark. I'm still here. This is WRJK797, and you're doing such a good job with this question that I think we'll uh, <laughs> we'll just stand by and let you continue. All right. Thanks, Quentin. Uh, let me reset here for a second. Yeah, you know, and I think Mark in the mountains. Uh, Mark in the Mountains. I'm Mark over here in Houston, so Mark in the Mountains, uh, I don't know what else to call you. Um, I think Mark in the Mountains is definitely hitting the nail on the head uh, with talking about the transmit powers. There's so many factors that go into it, everything from the feed line to the intended design. Um, you know, that really affects the, the power outage uh, of, off the antenna. Uh, even the design, what the angle of tilt or angle of takeoff of the antenna is, if you're even hitting uh, the 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 because everything is downward. So if you're 20 feet in the air and you're looking at the, the curvature of the Earth, everything is down looking. But most antennas have the uh, especially the closer to the ground they are, the the higher their angle of elevation or angle of takeoff tends to be. Meaning if you're using an antenna with any dB gain other than like a quarter wave, which we know is kind of a, a, a circle, a donut if you would. But as you start squishing that donut down and in, in increasing your dB gain. You also start tilting towards uh, the the atmosphere, um, so you're not looking straight ahead. You're not looking down. You're actually looking slightly up towards the the sun or the moon, whichever time of the day you're in. So so we have to take that into consideration. Plus the line loss, plus the in, antenna, uh, what the antenna is doing, uh, and then we also have to factor in the vegetation, the shrubbery, and then you know at that point five miles away. If they're sitting down into a hole, like say they're in a creek bed or a canyon, 
then that would definitely affect even more because uh, anytime it has to go through um, some kind of a solid object like earth, like dirt, concrete, um, the signal just doesn't go through it. The, the UHF were, were, were too high of a, a frequency to penetrate earth. Uh, pretty much any radio signal is too high to penetrate earth. All we can kind of do is skip around the earth. So um, I hope that answers the question uh, of why 30 miles, uh, I'm sorry, 30 feet in the air is not getting you five miles. Yeah, let's turn it back to uh, the six one nine, and uh, I'm sorry, we'll head it back to six one nine, and then we'll uh, we've got comment from four eight seven. So uh, four eight seven, please stand by. Six one nine, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just trying to figure out if I put an antenna up in the air, if I want to reach thirty miles, how far up do I need to go with an antenna? Yeah, 914, maybe you can help calculate that for him. He's trying to reach 30 miles, so, uh, yeah, we've got to work backwards from there. But, yeah, well, 914 is looking into how high an antenna needs to be based on Matt's location. How, uh, how tall does the antenna have to be to reach 30 miles? And 487, go ahead with your comment. Seven, are you still out there? Uh, you called in with a, a comment um, a minute or two ago. Are you still there? Yeah, I accidentally uh, hit, hit the wrong button. I was just going back to that antenna uh, situation with that gentleman had. Uh, I was just wondering, I, I kind of caught maybe the conversation halfway. Uh, he's trying to reach a repeater from his uh, base. Is that am I understanding him so far? That's another good question for uh, for 619, because uh, you're right. Uh, I have a feeling I know what 487 is getting at. If he's just trying to reach a certain repeater, then you know maybe he should be looking into uh, a directional antenna, but uh, like a Yagi. I guess Mark and I were kind of assuming that he was uh, such a repeater. Matt, go ahead. And uh, stand by 914. I'm not trying to hit a repeater. I'm trying to put a repeater up. All right, Matt. Well, I ran the numbers. Put a repeater up. Okay. All right, then I'm going to back out of here and then let the, uh, some of the repeater owners probably give you better advice than I would. The higher the better, obviously, for a repeater, but not, you know, it depends on the terrain and everything. But, uh, yeah, I bet one of the repeater owners probably answered that question better than I did. Seven nine seven. Uh, let's let uh, let the repeaters we set here for a moment stand by. All right. Yeah. Four eight seven. Yeah. Don't feel bad. Uh, Mark and I were working under the assumption that uh, he was talking about putting up a repeater, and uh, yeah, he just confirmed now that 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 was the case. But it was never actually said. So for all the people that are out there listening and uh, trying to learn about why we might be interested in, you know, being able to reach out in an omnidirectional pattern, uh, yeah, this is more for uh, setting up a repeater. So uh, 914, go ahead. Yeah, I ran some numbers here um, on it, looking at it. So I'm coming up with a antenna height. Uh, now you have to you have to it's the difference between the antenna height and the height of the person. So um, both of those can take into effect. It depends on the elevation change. Uh, if the person is using a handheld at five feet off the ground, if he's using a base station at 20 to 30 feet off the ground, and the height of the transmitter up on the tower, the antenna on the tower. Uh, this is not to can take into consideration um, feed line loss or antenna design on the tower itself. This is just a line of sight calculation. So if you were standing on the tower and you look down to the, the edge of the earth where the other person might 
possibly be standing, and we're talking 30 miles from the antenna to the seeing that person, um, we're looking at 450 feet of power below you, 450 feet to get you the radio horizon based on uh, the, the radio range that's actually taking slightly the curvature of the Earth, because uh, the radio will slightly curve over the Earth, that gets you at 29.99 feet. If you wanted a true line of sight, a better number to work with, at 30 miles instead of 450 feet, you're talking 600 feet. So line to sight is 600 feet above Earth, and then the radio horizon is 450. So you can actually reduce it down some. You don't have to be right at 600. Now remember, anything over 200 feet, the FCC requires uh, lighting. Uh, I'm sorry, the FAA requires lighting on the towers, uh, and the FCC requires inspections on the towers. So um, the maximum height, if you're doing it without going through the rigmarole of the FAA approval, so the maximum height uh, without going through all the FCC uh, and the FAA lighting requirements um, would be 200 feet. And 200 feet would put you at 17.32 miles line of sight, or 20 miles radio service. One other thing I did want to mention, there's a good website to go to if you wanted to do some calculations on propagation um, yourself to, to play with some of the numbers. Um, you can go to a website, uh, VE2. D-B-E, that's Victor Edward II, David Bravo Ector com to uh, check on uh, some more of those calculations to run some more numbers. But um, yeah, essentially 200 feet in the air well, is going to get you 20 miles of radio service. So that answers my question. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mark, that is that was some nerdy stuff right there. <laughs> that was awesome. So I really appreciate you coming in here with all all that information and all that work. So uh, yeah, I'd be curious to know if we did 199.9 feet um, in somewhere flat like Houston, you know, how far would that reach us? You know, not taking into account the buildings and other things. But uh, a quick uh, clarification: the URL that Mark and David suggest for propagation calculations, uh, prepared a copy. The URL for propagation calculations, copy Victor Echo Two. Delta Bravo Echo. Again, that's VE2 DDE. Victor Echo 2 Delta Bravo Echo.com. And uh, that comes straight from David, WQVS 960. Thank you so much for dropping that uh, to us in the middle of the net here. And we appreciate all your help. Uh, back to Mark. Yeah, thanks. That's really a great website to go to. One side note about that website if you're visiting it, um, it looks a little weird because it's almost kind of in a different language. Um, just click on the first link when you get onto that website, and it's going to ask you to register or to create a, a, an account with that. Just do it. They're not. Uh, it, I've been on that website. It, 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 it really lets you play with the numbers on uh, anything that's non-commercial frequency, so your your GMRS, uh, some of your ham frequencies. Um, if you try putting in a commercial uh, uh, megahertz frequency, um, it's going to kick it out and tell you that you're going to have to pay for it. But um, anything that's non-commercial, that website is great. Like I said, just register. It looks kind of a weird setup, but once you get registered and signed into that website, it's really, really fun to play with it because you can fine-tune everything from the, from the line loss to the uh, input uh, watts, to the antenna dB gain or loss. 
So there's a lot of a lot of information to put into that website, and then it creates you a pretty cool map, which I think uh, I've seen on several of our websites that we're actually using these maps uh, when we're showing our repeater coverage on some of the GMRS repeaters out there. So um, all right, back to you, Quentin. Thank you all, everyone, tonight, and I hope everyone has a good Wednesday. WRJK seven nine seven six one nine. Any any final comment or anything to add? Uh, WRAS six one nine. This is WRJK seven nine seven. Back to you. WRAS six one nine. No, I was just trying to figure out how many feet up I needed for every mile. I want to go out. Okay. Yeah, definitely get reading. definitely go go search on the internet because that line is not horizontal. Uh, the, the, the 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 main problem here is the cost of that that tower is not horizontal either. You're not going to gain the 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 higher your tower is the the uh, for every foot of of, of antenna height, uh, you're not getting the same return on on propagation gain. Um, and that directly relates into money out of your pocketbook. So you fi you have to find that sweet spot. Can you live with 200 feet at a at a 20 mile a 15 to 20 mile radius? Um, are you are you going to have to put in multiple repeaters to hop along? That might even be a better situation, especially if we're linking them together. Maybe one one at one location, one halfway, and then a, and then a second one uh, to the closer final destination. Uh, um, or are you going to be able to get up onto a commercial tower or maybe a television station, um, you know, and, and uh, be able to come halfway up or three quarters up the tower and set the antenna and get the gain you want from that? Um, so, it, it, like I said, it directly relates back to your pocketbook. Go on the web, Google search, um, line of sight calculator, and then you can uh, look at, they actually have the formula on there. And then, like we said, that website we mentioned before, I'll read off the website again. It's Victor Edward to David Bravo E dot com. D E two D B E dot com. Those are, are two really good resources to get you that information that you're looking for. Um, all right. Uh, thank you again and y'all have a good night. Uh, Stand by 216. Uh, I'm just going to give a short break here for the repeaters to reset after Mark's comments, and I'll be right back with you. All right, this is WRJK 797 Quentin with this Wednesday's TechNet. And uh, yeah, Mark, I think we've done. More than enough, you know, you gave a rough answer, you gave the tools, and uh, yet, if anyone ever wants uh, more help, you know, specifically, then uh, this is a good place to come for that kind of information. There's a lot of repeater owners on here, but uh, yeah, at fear of beating the horse to death, uh, we'll <laughs> end it up to 216.
as someone studying to be a network administrator, I find them to be uh, very interesting. And uh, Linus Tech Tips recently did a video where he was able to get about six, seven miles away, uh, what was it, uh, gigabit inter internet to his parents' house on a little uh, island, you know, six miles from shore, which is two Yankees pointing at each other. And I heard 331 out there with a comment. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Kate Clinton, for on the net. I was just going to mention, you know, don't forget about reflectivity issues. You know, Myra Peters adjacent to downtown Minneapolis. And, uh, you get very interesting corridors where the travel, the signal will travel quite a ways with additive reflections and things like that. And if you remember the old ghosting of the old AM uh, TV uh, signal, uh, something similar to that. And the other thing I want to mention real quick is um, I'm looking for someone that has experience uh, with real uh, signal analysis software or something low end, but has maybe taken something like Kraken SDR and is able to apply uh, the signal level output of a radio uh, and overlay it on a, on a software map so you can essentially drive around and create a real signal map versus a versus an approximated one, which most of these websites are doing just approximations. I'd actually like to get a, uh, a radio that can give me the signal level output uh, digitally and then you know, receive that as I drive around and then see where the hot spots really are and then build a map over time. Just something to think about and if anybody knows that or has any experience there, uh, look me up and send me an email. I'd love to love to chat with you. WRJK797. Yeah, we do something like that too in, uh, with TexasGMRS.net. We have uh, these, you know, maps that are based off of the, uh, the topography and, uh, you know, the, the terrain type. So, you know, the, the general hot spots of, of the map. And uh, I don't know what the actual real numbers are like, but it's incredible how much uh, analysis you can do. Uh, does anyone else have any, have any uh, answer to, uh, to that topic? Give your call sign now, please. All right, 906, acknowledged. Go ahead. One point I want to make for you guys is a lot of times uh, calculators. Uh, or basically a, a really a first order approximation, maybe a second order approximation. I think it's kind of a, a gross calculation. And the, the fine details a lot of times are uh, you, if you can't close the link due to the intervening terrain. So it may be flat as a budget table for let's say five or ten miles. And then you've got a small ridge line or a small set of hills. And uh, when the signal reaches those, those points, it can either cause a shadow on the back side or it can cause a loop of knife face refraction. Then you end up with additional needs to pass. And a lot of these calculations where they start telling you the you know, rate the antenna to, you know, like I said, six, seven, eight hundred. So if you raise the antenna at 6, 7, 800, 800, 1,000 feet, whatever, that you find out that there's areas, and if you go to a really well done uh, map simulation of, of the interaction of the radio waves with the tiny computers, you see the beams of energy that stretch out a little further than uh, uh, what might be the normal range of the antenna in the site. Uh, location and it depends on the height of the uh, antenna of the radio that you're trying to reach or communicate with because you might be able to reach that antenna if it's low to the ground but if you had it into the transmitter tries to transmit back, it back to the meter uh, it has a lot of multi path and so because of the structure that appears on you won't be able to make the, the link to the object 
okay, so I'll just do a quick reset. So that's just a couple of scenarios where uh, you, know, you can uh, do the calculations and you can build your system and uh, let's say side of it a, a high point, but uh, it's prepared to not see two goals uh, in a given direction. And it's physiology, the other issue about the physiology is that uh, you now narrowed your uh, field of view, if you will, of what station can actually communicate with your repeater. So if you put a block of one or a block of a uh, you're going to limit the service uh, area uh, to you know, a, a specific field of view to the general direction. And that's, that's kind of my comment for the meeting. Have you already seen that as a All right, 906, thank you so much for that comment. And that wraps up all the time we have for any further comments or answers. But I do want to hand it back to 331 one more time. And uh, you mentioned people contacting you or reaching out to you. Uh, so I don't know if you wanted to you know, add some final comments you know, about how people can reach you, if that's you know, something, if they have more answers or Back to you, 331. Great. Uh, Quentin, thank you. And I appreciate uh, giving me a comment there. And I really hope you have a wonderful night. I don't want to keep you. I know you've got a life outside of this as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm just looking for anybody that kind of has experience with something like the Kraken SDR project. It's K as in Kraken SDR. Look it up on the web. Very interesting. I'm just looking to actually produce real signal maps off of observed uh, observed signals versus approximated signals um, and see if that could be something of use. It might be very, very valuable for uh, the GM reps and the ham community. And so I'm kind of curious. Uh, you can get a hold of me, uh, WRHY331, on my GM rep site. I run a repeater up here in Minneapolis. So we link into a couple others as well that they're online as well. In fact, Dave. When six was coming in, our sister repeated down in Farmington. But uh, look me up uh, in my emails there. Send me an email. I'd love to talk. Uh, really be fun to get a project like this going. Uh, again, WRHY331. Thanks very much, guys. All right. Thank you so much for giving that information, 331. And uh, yeah, we definitely, or at least I definitely need to need to participate more in all the forums. I know Texas GMRS has a forum, SWCRS has a forum, and I believe uh, Midwest GMRS probably has a forum. And so I need to do a better job of uh, staying linked in with the, all the different communities. And uh, I'm sure mygmrs.com might have a, a forum as well. I know in, in Texas, we've been using our Facebook page more than the forum. so. Yeah, I just I need to do a better job staying connected with the rest of GMRS. It is a really small world, and I'm sure there's someone out there that knows everything and more, and it's just, you know, a matter of getting connected. And I think the link will stay up here, so uh, if, if you guys do want to continue that conversation, if anyone wants to reach out to 331 right after I'm done, then uh, feel free to do so. But uh, stand by. I'm going to let the repeaters reset, and uh, we're going to wrap up. Okay, the repeater should be reset now. So I thank everyone's patience, and uh, some topics went on for a long time. We, we talked about dash cams for half an hour, and uh, that may have been selfish of me since I'm in the market. But, uh, yeah, we also spent 20 minutes talking about, you know, repeater heights, and uh, we even got into some discussion of SDR and, you know, some stuff that's, you know, a little too nerdy for me. I'm <laughs> just kidding. But uh, I'm only an amateur technician. I'm not an extra. This concludes the Wednesday GMRS TechNet. Thank you to everyone who asked questions and to those who helped answer them. If you'd like to make suggestions for future topics, please feel free to contact us throughout the week. WRJK 797 break. This net utilizes.
utilizes linked repeaters throughout the United States that are part of the MyGMRS network. Please visit MyGMRS.com. That's Mike Yankee Golf Mike Romeo Sierra.com. For more information on this network, its linked repeaters, and the GMRS service in general, Please continue to support your local GMRS groups that you're a part of, and uh, we will all grow this thing together. I pause. This TechNet meets every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, and PM Arizona. A special thanks to all the repeater owners that make this net a reality, and we'll see you all next time. This is Quentin, WRJK797, returning the repeater system to its regular operation, and I'll be signing off for the evening. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you for letting me use your systems. Thank you for being part of our tech net. The end. Clear. Hey, Quinn, this is Matt, W-A-R-F-619. Thank you for your service, and thanks for letting me hear my questions answered. No problem. I'm glad it helped. And uh, if you ever need more specific help, like you saw, Mark will, Mark will bust out the calculator. <laughs> Thank you for being out there, WRUZ914, uh, for the YouTube stream and uh, for answering questions. And David, thank you for helping out on the back end. There's so many people out there making sure that everything works so that everyone listening can have a, a somewhat enjoyable experience. Please note, the Southwest Community Radio System will disconnect in five minutes. SWCRS will be uh, disconnecting. Steve, Operator Steve, you're still out there. I hope you're having a good one. And uh, you should join our Zello group if you have a Zello. Seven nine seven signing out. Good evening, everyone. And a big ditto uh, on all the kudos to you, Quentin, for running the net, uh, and everybody out there participating and listening. Have a good night, everybody. W R H Y three three one. Thanks again, Quentin. Uh, WRMG six zero two. And uh, good night if you're out there. I'll bring it to you. WRNZ 715 radio check.
715, your transmission is being heard. Seven one five W R E Z now and four uh five by five on that transmission, sir. Five by five. For sure, uh, we hear that too on our side. All right, 715, well, you all have a good night. I'm glad it's working good for you over on that end, and uh, we hope to talk to you soon.